Now, lots of high-level exchanges, very senior officials have taken place over the course of the last several months. Mostly, principally, I should say, it's visit by the U.S. side to China. All the senior officials have had long discussions with their counterparts in Beijing. And there have been a few visits by Chinese officials to the U.S. as well at the very last minute uh, in preparation for this meeting. So I would assume, under the circumstances, some agreements have been reached, or at least mutual understanding have been reached on what is to be produced as the outcome of this head of state's meeting without anticipation of some positive results, and there would be no need for it to take place. It's re even reached a point where San Francisco had cleaned up itself before the visiting dignitaries arrived for APEC summit. The homeless have been cleared out, drugs have been cleared out, so now we will miss the famous site of Tent City in San Francisco, of people living in tents on the street. I guess the U.S. government would like to have some face as well. So it's not just China that is very big on face. Before the meeting, President Biden had said something that is quite different from what had been said over the past. What had been said over the past is, oh, first is disengagement, followed by de-risking, all of which are still negative and strongly negatively connotated. But now President Biden said, I think we're not trying to decouple from China. He specifically said, we're not trying to decouple. And what we're trying to do is change the relationship to be better. Now that is very, very different tone from how it has been over the course of the last several years. The negativity is taken out and positive spin of hoping to achieve something positive is now very, very obvious. There are many issues between China and the United States that need to be addressed. Some are new, for example, the Ukraine-Russian conflict, and now Palestine and Hamas versus the Israelis. These are global issues which impact everybody. But there are a lot of outstanding issues which have been there for quite some time. The continued arming and the pushing of the U.S. for Taiwan to move away further from its homeland, from China, that's been there for quite some time. And it continues to be pushed by the U.S. And then... There have not been contact or communications between the military of the two sides. And hopefully this issue will be settled and regular channels of communication will be once again established. And of course, trade war, sanctions against Chinese companies. Will over a thousand Chinese companies put on the so-called entities list or basically a blacklist? And then duties are still imposed on Chinese products from the trade war four years ago. So assume something may happen on this front. On the economic front, you have the trade issue, you have the sanctions issue, and you also have the issue of the U.S. probably asking the Chinese or asking the Chinese government to please, even if you don't buy any more U.S. treasuries, please don't dump any more because it's really causing the market to be very negative on U.S. treasuries because they now have to issue a lot more just to survive in the next couple of months. Uh, this year, for example, just the interest payment alone could probably reach a trillion dollars. That's very, very serious for a country that is not producing positive balance sheet. On the business side, there's to be a dinner on Thursday night between Chinese president and U.S. corporate executives from press reports as well from what I hear privately from friends. Boy, a seat at the table is really hard to get and it's really hot. U.S. senior corporate executives are all hoping to be in the presence of President Xi because the Chinese market continues to be very, very important for them, not only as a market, but also as part of the supply chain, the global supply chain, which the global U.S. companies have really come to rely on and hence no longer can talk about disengagement. What will happen to the U.S.-China relationship in the long run? medium term and in the short term. I think in the short term, there could be some positive moves to relieve some of the tensions that have been brought about by the negative actions by, of the U.S. over the last five to six years. There could be some amelioration of the trade war measures, the sanctions one has to see, because if you use so-called national security and apply everything 
against national security, then everything doesn't work. In the medium term, in the next couple of years, we are, of course, going to be seriously hit by the U.S. elections. Because when the elections take place in the U.S., especially national elections, anything goes. Any argument goes. Anything that promotes populism or gets you an extra few votes will be promoted, even if it's ridiculous, even if it's harmful, especially even if it's long-term strategically erroneous for the country's own interests, damages the country's own interests. But short-term getting votes decides everything. In the long term, strategically, there's no question, I believe, that the conflict or competition between China and the United States will continue to flare up over the long term. And the reason is very simple. One reason is U.S. cannot accept not to continue its faith in so-called exceptionalism. U.S. has to be number one. Now, even not taking into account of China, the global south is rising. The developing countries are rising. They're becoming more powerful, more independently minded. They're more interested in protecting the interests of the, their own country than blindly following the U.S. So I think the multipolar world is coming, and it's coming fast and furiously. U.S. cannot continue to dominate and as a monolithic hegemony, hegemonistic dominant force for much longer. And then China, of course, is a very powerful force on the global economic front and political front increasingly as well, judging by, for example, the, res the restoration of diplomatic relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia as promoted by China. And actually, the agreement was signed in Beijing. This is a very significant move, a very significant development for the Global South, where the Global South will now seek peace, security, stability and development. Without stability and peace, you cannot have development. And this is being recognized by all. And hopefully this will continue to promote the multilateral world that the developing countries are seeking for, in which they can project their own thoughts, their own independent views, and then also protect their interests against pressure from the U.S. I think ultimately, long term, the U.S. will have to accept that the developing countries will become a more and more powerful force and will become a new voice on the global stage. And China, of course, is part of that developing world, even if China independently can be a very powerful force. So under the circumstances, I think the U.S. will have to accept this multipolar world. So in the short term, there will be some improvement in China-U.S. relationships, in the medium term, depends on the outcome and the development in the elections. What will happen is 50-50. But in the long term, there will continue to be competition and strategic competition between China and the United States. But increasingly, China's role will be enhanced by the global south. Developing countries will continue to forge ahead in forming a multipolar world.